Stephen Brown is an associate professor at the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior at Mac Mac uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Ontario, Canada. I hope I got that geographical details. Yep, perfect, perfect. Okay. So uh, Steve directs the, the Neuro Arts Lab. He got his PhD in the Department of Genetics at Columbia University and completed a number of uh, postdoc stays in exciting places such as the Pasteur Institute in Paris or Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And here he brings a very important perspective when we talk about pantomime, that is the perspective of, uh, I guess, aesthetics and arts, because um, his research is mainly concerned with neural bases of the arts, such as music, dance, drawing, acting, on which he published exten extensively. He's also interested in pantomime, uh, and we all, at least here, know his paper, How Pantomime Works. He's a co-editor of a number of books, including The Origins of Music, published by MIT Press. He's also uh, the author of the forthcoming book uh, that has a very bold title, <laughs> The Unification of the Arts, to be published by Oxford University Press. So it's great to have you here. And uh, Steve today will talk about the pantomimic origins of the narrative arts. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna... So actually, I wanna start by saying um, Jankuya Barzo uh, to, to the organizers, if you could understand what I said. And I'll also give a small um, taksamika to Johan Bloomberry for coordinating uh, the speakers, including myself. Um, I really wish I could be there. I, I'm teaching two courses <laughs> right now and just getting away is very difficult, but this has been an amazing two days. And I'm sorry that I, I've missed the morning talks. And so I'll apologize if I'm saying things that have been brought up already that have been discussed uh, during the morning sessions. So, oops, I always have this problem. I, I need to do something and share again, it gets stuck. Okay, so yes, um, I do have a book that's it's coming out actually next week um, in Europe and in January in North America. So it's called The Unification of the Arts, um, a framework for understanding what the arts share and why. And so I was actually very excited to get this invitation because in working on this book, uh, pantomime appears in, in various different locations. And this invitation actually allowed me to synthesize all the pantomime elements into, into one location. So again, I hadn't really thought about this, th this integration before I got this invitation. But then once I got the invitation, I thought, okay, I had, I had some discussion in this chapter, that chapter. And so for me, it was very exciting to actually bring these ideas together into one location. So again, very, very excited to get the invitation, excited to be here. And I've, I've really benefited from these two days of talks. So um, within the book, so here's just the table of contents. And so I'll show you in, in a slide or two that I divide the arts into two categories that I call narrative arts. And then these arts of interpersonal coordination that I, I really won't be talking very much about. But to me, dance is to the body as music is to the voice and different means that humans are able to uh, coordinate their actions. I'll focus on these. And, and Jordan brought up the term narrativity yesterday. So I'll think about the, the visual arts as being the static form of narrativity. And then things like theater and storytelling as being their dynamic. Uh, counterparts. So I just kind of introduced that already. And during the question session, I, I raised this point, and so now I'm going to go into further detail. But um, if you look at the Republic, Plato in, says there, there are really two different forms of storytelling that he calls diegesis and mimesis. Okay, sorry, this I just it's a Zoom, it's a Zoom thing. I know from teaching with Zoom. Like, just give me one second. I need to. I need to unshare and reshare. This is a common issue for me. Okay, this won't happen again. Um, so uh, what we can call in more colloquial terms, um, narration and acting. So when I, when I use the term mimesis and mimetic in this talk, it's going to be in connection with, with acting and, and theater. And so 
diegesis occurs, uh, storytelling occurs according to the narrator's voice or perspective, whereas in mimesis or acting, uh, the characters are, are telling the story directly. And so typically, not always, but typically the narrator is external to the story, whereas the characters are, they, they exist within the story world that's depicted in the story. And so again, not always, but typically um, in diegesis, the story is told from the third person perspective. Um, again, from the narrator, who's typically external to the story. Whereas in mimesis, the characters are embodied by actors. The actions of the story are, are conveyed through the actor's actions, so the characters are embodied. Typically in diegesis, the story is told, you know, once upon a time, there was a, a girl, whatever, it's told in the past tense, whereas in mimesis, the, the actions are occurring um, in front of us in the present. And typically diegesis is monologic, whereas mimesis is essentially a depiction or recreation of a series of conversations uh, between the characters. And I, I, I'm going to end this talk with a little bit of mention. I think Francesco's talk, uh, Alessandra, mentioned something about dialogue, and I just want to all conclude with a small point about, about dialogue at the end here. Gestural theories of language origin do not account for whether language originally evolved as a diegetic or mimetic device, or both. And actually, Plato talks about the, the both. I'll talk about the both also in this talk, but it could have been both. But I think when I look at gestural theories, they don't really specify whether this was more the diegetic or the mimetic um, origin of language and communication. Again, in terms of my, my classification of the arts, I, I contrast the narrative arts with these arts of interpersonal coordination. I won't mention them very much, just a little bit um, towards the end. And then among these narrative arts, again, static forms of narrativity that we find in visual art versus more dynamic forms of narrativity, again, using the distinction of Plato and the other ancient Greeks between um, diegetic narrated forms of storytelling versus mimetic or acted out forms of storytelling. And I happen to know a few professional mime actors. And so I, I, I get this distinction from them. And so this is not my own thinking. This is what I've learned from talking with people who do this professionally is that the term pantomime versus mime has essentially this connotation that pantomime is thought to be more of a diegetic a device, a form of narration. Whereas when you talk about mime acting, we're talking about something more mimetic. This hasn't really come up at this conference and I don't wanna get into it too much. But again, this is something that I've learned from people who do this, that a pantomime versus a mime, they, they, it falls along this distinction between uh, diegesis and mimesis. I will talk about narrative forms of dance, which are essentially the same thing as theatrical acting, typically without words. And so I'll, I'll get there. Um, so now the, the brunt of this conference about pantomime. And I've only, unlike most of you in the room, I've only published a single article. And actually in listening to Marta's talk, I realized that this paper originally, in its original form, had a whole empirical study connected with it, which we had to cut out because the re reviewers weren't happy about it. Um, but I do have this empirical study similar to Marta's. It's not done with actors, it's done with just uh, psychology students. Um, I've never, I should really just find it and, and publish it because it's something, I, I totally forgot about it until I was listening to Marta's experiment today and I realized that I've done something similar with, with non-actors, but okay, I won't talk about that today. Um, what I will talk about is this and, um, so in, in talking about what pantomime is, which is sort of you know, a big discussion topic, we do have to think about how to classify it. And so one thing that I, that I have brought to this field is bringing some terminology that comes from the domain of spatial cognition, where you have this distinction between, again, spatial cognition according to a more egocentric or more allocentric perspective. And so existing terms in the literature were you know, very awkward <laughs> terminologies like IO versus BPO, very difficult things to understand. You have the McNeil um, character viewpoint, whatever. I decided that it might be useful to think about these terms that I'd, I'd used in previous work on, on dance, um, egocentric and allocentric, and think about the different spaces in which they operate. So more peripersonal space versus extra personal. Um, so when I, when I teach this to my students, um, as a basic rule of thumb or rule of hand, I'll use the hand, I say to people to distinguish these two, think about when you're doing the pantomime, is your hand a hand? Um, if it is, it's probably an egocentric kind of pantomime like an IO, or is your hand 
some other object which is not a hand, in which case we have this body part replacement, which is allocentric. We, we talked about a category and actually um, Marta talked about at the end, I think with, with the hair, something in between, and I won't go into it today, but basically when I teach this to my students, I say, think about what your hand is doing. If your hand is a hand, then the pantomime is in the egocentric category. If your hand is anything but a hand, um, then think of that like uh, call me, um, then it's more in this allocentric category. Um, I won't go into this, but we, we had a nice scheme here because I really hadn't seen anything like this before talking about that, you know, pantomime typically involves uh, both hands and these hands can be doing similar things or radically different things. And so the common example I always give when, when talking about pantomime is, is the tennis serve, or the, which is two IOs. One hand is holding the imaginary tennis ball. The other hand is grasping the imaginary tennis racket. And then you do, you know, the gesture of the serve. So that, that's a double IO, which is different than, you know, I went to the restaurant and here's my, my one hand is the pad that the waiter is writing on. And then my finger is, is the pen. So the, the waiter took down the order. And so now this is a double BPO. Uh, both hands are doing the BPO or, you know, it was raining, rain was coming down, which is another kind of called the joint BPO. I really haven't seen anything like this that, that talked about the differential roles of the two hands, how they are either distinct or how they combine. So I found this to be a, a useful analysis um, at the time. This, this came up in Marta's talk and maybe other talks as well, but um, all this works really nicely. And except when it comes to this issue, which is gonna be the central, the central issue of my talk, which is going to be when you mimic another person. Um, and so think about me if I'm doing an impersonation of Donald Trump and you know, Donald Trump, he does lots of these, like I could do, you know, uh, um, and is a hand, but it's not my hand. So doing Don, oops, I think my, okay. So uh, doing, doing Donald Trump seems like it's supposed to be an egocentric pantomime because I'm, I'm doing hands. But on the other hand, it's really, it's a total body replacement because my whole body now is becoming the Donald Trump. And so it's the most confusing situation. And it's actually gonna, like I said, it's going to be the central point of my, of my talk today, but it's actually the situation that I find the most difficult to think about that if I'm doing an impersonation of another person, uh, just momentarily or as an actor, uh, my gestures um, are very egocentric. So my hands are my hands and my, my legs are my legs, but they're not mine, they belong to another person. And so it's almost like it's a total BPO. It's like my whole body is being replaced, but I'm doing it in a very egocentric way. So it's the most confusing one. I think Marta made allusion to this, this issue um, as well. Gestural theories of language or have not accounted for whether pantomiming originally occurred egocentrically or allocentrically or both. And I think this is, this is one of the most important questions because I think we have to think about that, that these two forms of pantomiming really are categorically different. Whether my hand is a hand during the pantomime or whether my hand is something else, you know, it really, it can't be both. It has to be one of the others. So these two forms of pantomiming really seem to me to be categorically different. And so in thinking about how pantomime, uh, you know, we're thinking about the origins of communication through pantomime, we got to think about is it is one kind or the other or both. And so in our discussion in this paper, um, we actually said, you know, based on this distinction, there are two possible ways to think about the origins. That there's, there's not just one gestural theory of language origin, minimally there are two. And so the first one would be if this evolved first as an egocentric form of pantomiming, this might emphasize something about people. And, and we said, even at this level, there's sort of two different degrees of, of transparency. So think about, we're not talking about, you know, professional actors from, from Lund. We're talking about people, you know, at the origins of this, of this process. They don't have the tool, they don't have the strategies for doing this. So obviously the most transparent way to pantomime egocentrically is to say, this is me, um, I threw something. When it comes to doing this where, you know, Joe threw something, Again, for professional actors in Sweden, they, they have tools that can show long hair for the whatever, but it's not so obvious at, at the origins of communication, how you signify that this action, um, this egocentric action throwing um, belongs to somebody else and 
and not me. So obviously the mo you know the default thing would be if I'm doing the pantomime that it was in fact me. Um, how we devise strategies for saying that this is now um, not me, that I'm doing a whole body replacement now that is, is somebody else, um, probably took you know a bit more work. The other allocentric, um, now the other, the other kind of, of origin story for pantomime would be the allocentric, which maybe is a bit less about people and more about you know, scenes, the environments. So we talk about the environment. And again, I think the, the most transparent one would be something like tracing out a shape or as Marta talked about, uh, tracing out a trajectory of movement. Um, that would be the easier one. The more complex and symbolic one would now be where your hand is, is not a hand, where your, your body part now represents something else. So, you know, two cars um, collided on, uh, on the freeway kind of a thing. Um, that requires, I, I know that the development, <laughs> developmental say that this occurs earlier with the, the tooth brushing, but this is a very high level of symbolism that now my hand is no longer a hand. My hand is now a car. We have two cars um, and they're colliding. So I think this is actually a very, very complex uh, form of communication. Um, anyways, so the basic point is, you know, not one gestural theory of language origin, but minimally two along the lines of this egocentric versus allocentric. And again, for both models, there's sort of the easier, more transparent form, self versus other, and tracing versus um, a BPO body part replacement. And so what I want, so the whole basis of my talk is going to be this, that from this egocentric, allocentric distinction, uh, we also can map on the platonic distinction between mimetic and diegetic, and that is going to be the next set of slides. So I'm going to turn this, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this uh, 90 degrees, but I'm going to, this will be, this is my sort of take home uh, message for, for this talk is that uh, there are these two forms of pantomime, this allocentric and egocentric, and from them we can imagine the origins of these two different forms of narrative that we get from Plato. So the allocentric leading to the diegetic arts, third person narration, whereas the egocentric pantomime leads or, you know, encompasses this, this mimesis and leads to these mimetic arts. And so in this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll use these examples. I'll talk about first the visual arts and then talk about various forms of the theatrical arts. But this is essentially my, my summary slide uh, for this talk. So I'll start with, with the visual arts and this notion about uh, diegetic narration. And so this is an example, again, that I, that I use in my teaching is, is thinking about the distinction between drawing and pantomime. And uh, Marta alluded to the fact that Cornelia Muller uh, talks about drawing, and I, I'm really sorry that I missed uh, missed uh, Cornelia's talk this morning. But I'm going to take this more to the actual the level of actual drawing. And so think about um, I'm going to the store and I, I'm looking for a box of a certain size. And so I tell the um, the clerk that I want a box sort of like like this, and I can do a tracing pantomime to kind of show the dimensions of the box. Or in another context, I can take a drawing tool. And I can imagine I'm, I'm doing this on a chalkboard and I can draw um, a box. And so my point is that, that, that pretty much I'm using exactly the same in terms of a motor plan and activations of muscles, you know, doing this um, as a tracing pantomime or doing this um, as a drawing essentially involves all the same muscle groups and the same motor planning and all that. The only difference is that, that one has a drawing tool and is able to leave a trace behind. And so the term that I've used in my writings to talk about this process of leaving a trace behind, I've talked about this as emanation. Initially, you have a canvas with nothing, and then through this, this drawing motion, an image is now going to emanate essentially out of nothing on the canvas. And so in, in a classic paper by Ekman and Friesen, where they talk about a classification of gestures, they refer to pantomimes as pictographs, kind of alluding to the, the, the pictographic nature of, of pantomimes. And so the difference, a big difference, the key difference I say between pantomime and drawing is that drawing leaves a trail behind, an image unfolds on the canvas. So again, think about this, I'm doing um, a tracing pantomime showing the dimensions of the box, or I have some kind of drawing tool, and now I have this image which is emanating, unfolding on the surface. But I think they're quite similar, again, at the motoric level. So that's why I'm going to argue for a pantomime origin of drawing. So drawing leaves a trail behind um, as an image unfolds, 
on the canvas, pantomime essentially is drawing in the air. So I use the, in my writing, I use the term emanation. So emanation is the emergence of an image um, on, on, as drawing occurs on a surface. This is really what, what defines all this, this mark making, uh, the defining feature of drawing as a motor behavior. Pantomime, by contrast, is, is essentially drawing in the air. So it's, again, it's the same motor activities, but there's no image, there's no, there's no long-term residue left on a surface. So it's essentially, it's the pantomime um, without, it's, it's the drawing without the emanation. So I'll think about pantomime as being akin to drawing in the air and that actual drawing is this leaving down of a trace onto a surface um, using a tool. And so this is a very simple sort of cognitive model. I think this kind of thing has come up throughout the conference that um, to do this kind of depiction and communication, you first have to have some kind of, you know, internal model, semantic memory of whatever object, or this could be action that's being depicted. So um, I think this came up in the Laurel Buxbaum talk yesterday that we have this, this how pathway, this, this visual motor pathway that we can take some internal storage, internal knowledge about some object or action, and then use this HAL pathway to translate it into this pantomime. And I would say that, again, in trying to build a pantomime theory of drawing, that drawing at its core has exactly the same kind of structure. When you're drawing an object or depicting an action through drawing, you first have to have this kind of semantic representation of the object or action. But drawing adds things beyond what is present in the pantomime. And so, for one thing, we almost always engage in, in tool use. Um, as I mentioned, this process of emanation to create marks, enduring marks onto a surface. Um, and then we get this, this depiction, this recreation of the object. So again, I think, I think the core of, of drawing comes from the representational capacity, uh, externalization that comes through pantomime. But now we do something similar motorically, but now we, we use a tool we're able to, through emanation, leave enduring marks onto a surface, leave a trail, uh, create an image, and then we get now this drawn depiction compared to this being, again, for me, kind of a drawing in the air. But I think that there's something more um, beyond that motor level is that this process of emanation mark making now leaves something behind as an enduring display, potentially, a cultural symbol for people that, that can exist long beyond people. And so we can now get the roots of cultural evolution of these images and objects in a way that this, not impossible with a pantomime, but more difficult um, with pantomime. Now we've created something enduring. And so that thing is able to last for you know millennia and be transmitted across cultures and to lead to cultural evolution of those particular uh, representations. As far as generating these kinds of figurative images um, in visual art, there are at least three different ways of doing it. Um, I think, and then Laurel talked about this distinction in her talk yesterday, it can be done from memory, um, it can be done as a form of tracing or as a form of copying where the, the model is present in front of you and you're trying to then recreate that, that scene um, onto the canvas. Um, we know that these are very, very ancient. So we know that this is, this is you know, the, the, Chauvet, the Chauvet cave from 32,000 years ago. We know that, that there weren't four horses sitting deep inside the caves. And so we know that, that these kinds of drawings had to have been done by memory. Um, these may be the most ancient forms of figurative representations, these hand stencils. There's a recent report from a group uh, in Germany, I think, uh, showing that Neanderthals also did these hand stencils in addition to, to modern humans. So this may actually be the origins of figurative representations is through tracing, followed by this, and probably much later um, by this. So just to sum up this, this part of the talk, so what does drawing add to a theory of pantomime? I think it brings a lot of things to the table, um, including tool use, and uh, Peter uh, Jarden Forsch talked about uh, demonstration, teaching uh, through tools and praxis, um, creativity, what I just talked about, this notion about emanation, mark making to generate images, these images become enduring displays for a culture and can undergo cultural evolution as these kinds of cultural symbols. So I think that compared to pantomime, this brings a lot of useful information in thinking about um, how pantomime works and how it could um, lead to other functions and other behaviors in human evolution. So now I'll move 
from diegesis, and I'll move on to talk about um, acting and mimesis. And so I, again, I talked about this top line. Now I'm going to focus on egocentric pantomimes leading to the mimetic arts. And okay, so this, was, this is not me saying this for the first time now, several speakers have brought this up, but I'll just reiterate what other people have said, that a gestural theory of, of language origin does not have to be mute. And I think, you know, Jordan mentioned this and, and Peter mentioned this during his talk as well. So um, much that I've read kind of argues that, that a gestural theory has to be mute, but I think there's no requirement that this early gesturing, this pantomimic gesturing um, had to any way, in any way be, be mute. And so for the purpose of this talk, I will divide these mimetic arts into the two categories of the vocal mimetic arts, standard theater versus the mute ones. And I'll talk about them separately. Um, and so a lot of my ideas for this come from um, this paper that I wrote, small paper that I wrote in 2017, um, proto-acting as a new concept, personal mimicry and the origins of role-playing. And I should say that I, I just read Michael's book prior to this, and so I was very influenced by a lot of ideas. And so I think this paper may not have come into existence had I not read Michael's book um, the year before I was working on this. So I really owe him a lot for, not that he talks about acting per se, but just sort of his, his way of thinking about things was really influenced my own thought processes at the time. And so we haven't talked about this very much, but uh, within social psychology, there's a school of thought called the dramaturgical perspective, which says that what we do, what we're doing right now um, is a form of uh, theater, a form of everyday role playing. So I wanted to contrast this kind of, we all play different roles. I'm, you know, I'm the speaker, I'm a professor, I'm someone's son, whatever, these different roles we play. Um, and then we have these professional actors who engage in dramatic acting. Um, they're trained people, they, 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 you know, they're performing Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet. And I want to argue that, that you know, these extremes are nice, but there are a lot of behaviors, a very heterogeneous group of behaviors that sit in between these extremes of the different personas of myself versus Hamlet, Romeo, and these, these fictional characters. And so I refer to this as proto-acting. And so for me, the point of demarcation between proto-acting and the self is this, that um, myself, I'm doing, whether I'm doing my, you know, I'm speaking at a conference or I'm a, I'm a customer at a restaurant, different personas of myself, they're all versions of myself. But when I engage in this proto-acting, suddenly I've, I've crossed the divide, I become a character. And so, for me, the basic process here is that I've engaged in a process of mimicry that all these other versions of myself, these were, these were me, but when I engage in the proto-acting, I'm suddenly for either a short time or you know, longer time, I'm somebody else. I'm, I'm some person who's not myself. Um, so I, I call this proto-acting as being the precursor for what professional actors do. So I wanna talk about this, this process um, of proto-acting because I think I'm now gonna make a pantomime a pantomime theory of acting, but using proto-acting as the, the starting point for, again, crossing the divide from me to being someone who's not me, some other person, some other character, or it could be an animal and the like. Um, so as I'll mention on, on a future slide, I think the most common version that occurs in everyday life is, is quotation and conversation. So I said, you know, I talked with my mother and she said, you better take out the garbage well, that was me, you know, as a young boy, she would say that. Um, for those three seconds, when I was saying, you better take out the garbage, I wasn't talking as myself. I was proto-acting. I was impersonating my mother. And so I think we do this all the time. We engage in a simple form of acting when we engage in quotation. Um, in the arts, we see many forms of this that are they're not full-fledged dramatic acting. They're a bit more dramatic acting. So a ventriloquist is going back and forth between um, himself and the dummy. We have impressionists who do, again, very short, like a minute or two um, depictions of characters. We have sketch actors, again, on TV who do sketches that last, you know, three minutes. They're in character, in those characters for three minutes, and then they're gone. They're into a different character themselves. Or likewise, pretend play in children for, you know, short-term engagements with, with characters. And so I won't go through this, this figure, but I talked about, I just mentioned a bunch of these different things, but I think the most common one that occurs in everyday life is when we do a quotation or a mimicry of some person as we're engaged in conversation 
um, about them. That again, during those few seconds that we quote or that we mimic, we're, we're, we're now acting, we're, we're not ourselves, we're impersonating the character, and then we go back um, to ourselves. And so a lot of the ideas uh, about this, I got, so this is, if you don't know this article, this is, this is one of the best articles in any field, not just in our field, but in any field. Um, I, I learned so much from this paper by Herbert Clark. So I really recommend that if you don't know this, this work uh, to read this paper, a very dense paper by Herbert Clark uh, called Depicting as a Method of Communication. And Clark's basic model is referred to as staging theory. And again, it's, it's kind of a dramaturgical idea that when we're engaged in communication, we're essentially, you know, we're, we're creating scenes, we're depicting characters. It's all a process of staging. As, as mentioned, it's very multimodal. And so when I do the pantomime that, you know, I, I was on the road today and I saw two cars colliding, it's going to be something more like, you know, I saw two cars colliding, pew, that kind of a thing where, you know, the sounds and the gestures are inextricably linked to one another. And when Clark talks about this, this is extremely multimodal. He talks about all the different acoustic things, the acoustic pantomimes, the music in many cases um, that go hand in hand with these, with these gestures. So I really encourage you to read Clark's work. And again, I, I learned a ton from, from this very densely packed um, article of Clark's. What I like about this idea too, is that I say personal mimicry unites vocal imitation and gestural imitation. I, I work in both these areas and these liter the, the literatures for one and the other are, are completely different. So vocal imitation, people talk about that in terms of the evolution of speech and they'll talk about, you know, bird song. And then this one comes up in, uh, things like praxis, um, you know, and so these these are really separate topics and separate literatures. But when we talk about these kinds of things in terms of mimicry of, of people, now we have to think about this this unification, this combination that we're doing the sounds and we're doing the gestures at the same time. So it's kind of a, for me a nice way to think about this evolutionarily as a way that could potentially link these two um, novel imitative capacities that we have for vocal imitation and gestural imitation. And this, I very nicely ripped off from, from Michael. And so it's really the inspiration here. So the top part is Michael's theory of language origin. And my only qualifier here is that I think that this is a model of evolution of diegesis, uh, evolution of narration. And what still is missing, uh, what I'm trying to offer here is the other limb, the theory of mimesis. So I think, you know, like I said, I was very inspired by this pantomime theory and the proto-symbol idea. But in the end, I see this as being the explanation for diegesis narration. And what we need now is something to account for this other form of storytelling that we call mimesis. And so then I throw in protoacting here and essentially have you know, a parallel um, pantomimic theory of, of acting and role playing compared to this one, Michael's as being that of diegesis. And actually, yeah, and so this came up a few times in this conference. So personal mimicry may be the origins of fictionality and pretense. So this may, you know, we talk about literature and fictionality and fictional worlds. And so the origin of this may be our capacity to impersonate characters. That may be the most basic form of pretense and fictionality is personal mimicry. And then we write novels and, and write plays uh, long after that. Just briefly, I have a very, I have a research program right now that I call role playing in life art and everything in between. So the life part is that, you know, life essentially, you know, in terms of dramaturgical theory is a parallel to theater. Art, theater is essentially a depiction of what's happening in art. And so everyday role playing, acting, theater. And then, but the stuff I really am focusing on with, with the research is all the stuff in between. And just briefly, like I mentioned, there's quotation and conversation, pretend play. The young generation, everyone is playing video games. I, I don't play video games, but all my students, all the undergraduates, they, they're, they're very involved in this. And so this engagement with avatars, we're, we're arguing is a form of proto-acting. Uh, people are very connected to fictional characters. So there's a whole discipline now about parasocial relationships, how people see fictional characters as, uh, as friends of theirs. So there are a lot of topics that sit in between the, these things that I'm, I'm exploring in my research. And so I, I like this perspective about life, art, and then everything in between. And so uh, what does theater bring to the study of pantomime? So I mentioned proto-acting, uh, the origins of theater, theatrical acting, multimodal communication, so vocalization and gesture combined, a unification of these, these two novel imitative capacities that, that humans have for vocal and gestural imitation, and then the origins of, again, fictionality and pretense. 
And so I'm going to move on now to the, the mute forms of diegesis. And so I kind of learned in Peter's talk that, that Michael talked about dance. And so I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm really sorry that I missed the morning talks, but <clears throat> so this will be the second mention of dance um, in this, this conference. So I talked about the vocal route. Now I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the mute, the mute route of um, my Mises, the mimetic arts. So theorists in this field, and I say this with all due respect, <laughs> typically, typically tell readers to not confuse pantomime with mime theater. So let's say, you know, we're, we're talking about pantomime <clears throat> at the origins of humanity. We're not talking about Marcel Marceau. So they, they, they you know, said, don't confuse them. But right now I want you to confuse them. I want to really blur this distinction. So I'm going to do what um, people in this room have told readers not to do. Uh, that I, I want you to actually confuse these two things. And I want to think about the contrast between, say, um, a ballet dancer who's performing a narrative a dance versus a mime actor. And so typically, if you think about, you know, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Swan Lake, um, each dancer uh, is performing one character. But then when I, when I talk about pantomime to my classes and I say the word pantomime, you know, there's actually two roots. There's panto and there's mime. Um, mime means to mimic, but what does panto mean? And so they don't know what panto means. And so I say, well, it's the same root as pan. And so then they think about, you know, pandemic. And so pandemic pan means all and everything. And so in ancient Greece, the pantomime was defined as this person who performed all the characters. The panto means they did all the characters, not just one. And th this is the origins of, of theater in ancient Greece, that initially it was just one person and one person did all the characters. And that's why they were the panto mime. Um, so typically for narrative dance, it's the ensemble. Here, typically one person is doing everything. Not always, but this is the typical situation. A mime theater is one, one actor, again, doing all the characters, doing all the vignettes, uh, done to music, um, optional music. I've seen, I've seen it both ways. Um, big difference here is that when you see the duel between Romeo and Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet, they, they use uh, swords or at least, you know, prop swords. Um, the mime actor, everything... That's the way it works. That's, that's the convention is that mime is an empty handed form of mimesis and theatrical representation. And dancers engage in uh, this vocabulary of dance, whereas um, mime actors do um, iconic gestures, they do pantomiming. So if I look at this now outside of just um, dance, but outside of a pantomime, but think about this um, as dance, I remember taking a course in African dancing. Uh, years ago, I've done a lot of dancing in my life. And so I remember, if you can see me, um, we were told to do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. As part of a movement with our body, we did this. And then we were told by the teacher who was from West Africa that this represents, uh, this is agriculture. You're spreading the seeds. Okay, so this is, you're in the field, you're working in the field. One, two, three, four. These gestures are mimetic of the action of uh, spreading the seeds. And so if you look at indigenous dance, this is quite universal, that um, there's a very strong narrative component to them. So narrative forms of dance in indigenous cultures throughout the world, the dance movements are often iconic depictions of everyday activities. So this kind of thing that I, that I talked about, I've actually done in different dances from different parts of the world, these kinds of actions that are depicting everyday activities or characters in their lore. And so these movements are essentially um, a ritualization uh, of everyday movement. So a ritualized form of pantomime where these things are depicting everyday movements, but now they're being done in a rhythmic fashion. And now they're being done in a very ritualized fashion as part of a choreographed dance. So I think this we, we get this notion about ritualization that we, that we get from uh, narrative forms of dance. And then just briefly, um, we also get <clears throat> music. So I won't go into this game, but like I said, for me, uh, dance is to the body as music is the voice. And so these two things have very different access to different forms of representation. So if you want to convey something narrative um, through dance, you're going to take advantage of pantomime. If you're going to do it in music, you're more likely to use, make the connection between a melody and language slash speech. So these two different forms of coordination also have very different connections with systems of representation where dance is connected with iconic gesturing through pantomime and music is connected much more with speech and language. 
Okay, so what does dance add to a theory of pantomime? I mentioned a ritualization of pantomimic gestures, a ultimately theatricalization of pantomime into mime theater, um, interpersonal coordination through group rituals, and even we get music, we can get some music being added into this, this stew um, of pantomime through this. And I know I'm running out of time. I have just a few more slides. So I just threw this in. I just have a few slides um, and, I'll, and I'm going to conclude. So uh, this really hasn't come up very much. It came up in the talk that Alessandra and Francesco gave. And I think it's quite important. I mean, I guess maybe it's been discussed quite a bit by you, but I haven't really seen much about um, that. Essentially, all theories, I mean, pretty much every theory of language origin is monologic. And, you know, and they're very good at doing that. But you know, I also, I work on conversation as part of my research. And so how do we get the origins of, of, of dialogue? And I don't know, I don't know the answer. And, you know, I don't think anyone knows the answer, but I think that there's a limitation. This is a, you know, a little bit of a dead end that we, we think about the origins of language simply as a monologue and not about the interaction between two people. Um, and so I guess this has come up and it sort of came up in the talk yesterday was, you know, was dialogue essentially the, the death knell of pantomime, the pantomime really is very good or can be very good as a monologic tool, but it doesn't really take us to dialogue. Um, Michael kind of mentioned this, maybe he was <laughs> being a little bit sarcastic at the time, but I think uh, turn-taking is thought to be an ancestral capacity that preceded conversation. So I think one of the common, I think Stephen Levinson, um, that turn-taking predated um, language. And then somehow we, as humans, we've kind of squished in uh, language into the, this turn-taking capacity. Maybe it's, it's unnatural as far as the timing because they're, they're very quick turns, but that maybe turn-taking is something which is ancestral and that conversation, uh, you know, built off of that, that capacity that we, now we're putting our, our language turns into these, this turn-taking capacity. So just briefly, um, features of dialogue. So it's not just the turn-taking, uh, but the fact that, that you and I are co-constructing a message and in addition, we're doing this um, through improvisation. And so if you look at the, the early theorists of, of conversation analysis, like, like Shegloff and Sachs, they talk about the fact that, that conversation is made up of these minimal pairs they call adjacency pairs, or this notion about implicature. Um, you ask a question, I give a response. And so the whole thing is not, it's not a monologue, it's something that we've co-constructed, uh, and we've done this on the fly as an improvisation. And again, for them, people argue about whether it's really pairs or larger units, but at the most basic level, we have these adjacency pairs. I say one thing, you construct an answer, you respond to that. Um, again, question and response is the most, most basic version, but there's a lot more to it than that. Okay, I think, I think I'm good on time now. So um, I'm gonna conclude. And so this is, again, this is my conclusion that I said that there are fundamentally two different kinds. And I, I, think, I think, like I said, categorically distinct forms of pantomime, the egocentric, the allocentric. I've argued now that this leads to two different, the two different forms of storytelling that Plato and the ancient Greeks talked about, that allocentric leads to diegesis, egocentric pantomime leads to mimesis. I gave the example of the visual arts here, and I gave the examples of theater and narrative dance and mime theater here. And here I just put everything, all those these things I talked about, but I think it's a very rich list of topics that could really enhance our discussion about pantomime, going from tool use to cultural evolution, um, acting, fictionality, ritualization. We even get some music uh, along the way. So I really, I'm, I'm looking forward to how these topics may, may play out with, with uh, this group um, over time. Because I think there are a lot of topics that haven't been discussed traditionally in this uh, pantomimic uh, school of thought. And Maybe this means something, I don't know, but um, thank you. Dziękuję za uwagę. Thank you for saying it on, on my behalf. Okay. Dziękujemy za uwagę. So we thank you for. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you for this very interesting talk that brings it, brings in a lot of elements that we usually don't think about or think very little. So hopefully this will initiate a lively discussion despite the hour. Michael. Thank you, Steve. I think the last time we met, 
you tried to convince everybody that Japanese was the original <laughs> language. So I now see you're converting to Polish. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. you know, well, firstly, since you're advertising books, let me add that there was a book recently from Benjamin's called How the Brain Got Language Towards a New Roadmap, in which I explicitly recruited people to come and discuss the gaps in the 2012 book. And that includes a couple of papers on primate, uh, on uh, turn taking. So uh, I agree with you that the original account I gave is um, too monologic. But, you know, I want to disagree with you, of course, otherwise <laughs> there's not much point in doing this. And I, I just don't see your claim that the egocentric rather than the allocentric leads to the theatrical arts. If you really thought theater was a matter of a few monadic individuals appearing on stage and doing their own thing, then uh, the theatrical arts would be egocentric. But in fact, the whole issue is that the playwright, um, in the first place, the um, actors as they rehearse are all simultaneously inhabiting the characters, but trying to inhabit the other characters and relate themselves to the external space in which they find themselves. And, and it seemed to me right from the start, your emphasis on the diegetic and the mimetic was very helpful, but then you ruined it by suggesting that we had to consider them separately. I, I mean, a sort of basic pantomimic act, one can imagine for proto-humans would be miming uh, or pantomiming, I don't care, uh, grab your spear and go around the other side of the elephant. And um, the grab your spear is sort of temporarily perhaps um, inhabiting the character of the other as you show you grabbing the spear mimetically to, to get them to grab their spear. And then going around the other side of the elephant is, is inherently allocentric. So I, I just say that was a great talk. Why screw it up? <laughs> All right, I'll leave it at that. That's very, that's very kind, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but the way you're talking about it, Michael, is that these are two different things that are being combined. So it's like, you know, grab your spear and then, so are you just, are you, are you arguing that there aren't the two different categories that, that you're combining two different things? So you're right that I, I kind of said that they're separate art forms. But I think at the level of the arts, they, they, they are. Maybe at the level of, you know, early human conversations, they're combined. Um, and, and Marsha's experiment, they were, they were combined. But are you trying to say that there aren't two different ways that are being like, so grab your spear and then, okay, let's walk around the whatever. You're, you're switching modes, so you're two different modes. Are, are you saying that there aren't the two different modes? I'm, I'm happy to say they're two different modes, but I think you were trying to separate them. Whereas I'm saying that even the most basic pantomimes tend to combine the two. Um, in, in uh, even if you're third person, uh, we had these these things from Marta where we were looking at scenes in which we had two characters. And so the person in some sense who was pantomiming or miming was inheriting each character in turn. And in doing so was maintaining an allocentric frame, if you like, in which to locate the two. The two. And, and while I'm confusing everybody, let me just go back to, I, I agree with you on, uh, in some sense that uh, drawing is frozen pantomime. And isn't it interesting from Marta's talk that we have these pictures we completely understand and these pantomimes that confuse the hell out of us. So what's going on? And there, presumably the idea is that pantomime is a limited bit rate and you lose the spatial Yep. relations, but then yep. signing space captures some of that within a conventionalized linguistic frame, whereas drawing captures the spatial relationships by the position on paper. So the material you've given us is incredibly rich. And I think it would just be better if you didn't want to say this type of art goes off from one aspect and this type of art goes off from the other aspect, 
but show us how these two different aspects are integrated in all these exciting things that you're asking us to relate to pantomime. Okay. Ta -da. So, <laughs> so my response just briefly is that um, in most cases, they're not combined. So think about when you look at, you know, Romeo and Juliet, they're doing the egocentric only. They're not, they're not doing the allocentric. And likewise, a painter doesn't do anything egocentric. I mean, they're transferring an image onto a canvas. You, you can't really do anything egocentric as, as, a, as, a, as an artist. You can only do the, you're depicting scenes on a canvas. So it's not, it's not gonna be an egocentric uh, gesture at that point. Sorry. Yeah. Look, well, let's take Romeo and Juliet. Okay, there's that balcony. Now, yep. Romeo knows Juliet's up there. Juliet knows that Romeo's down there. And then there was this guy, William Shakespeare. Did you know about him? Yeah, and, for sure. And he, he had this allocentric knowledge of Verona, which he managed to transplant this scene and put these characters there. And why you have to think that theatrical arts just concentrates on just what Juliet's doing all by herself without Verona, without the balcony, without Shakespeare. I, I, I'm just saying you've given us very valuable concepts. And I just don't see why you want to then tear them apart. You, you, you pointed out to us that we have tended perhaps to look at vocal origins uh, and music too much separately from the, the, the spatial display of pantomime. So you've given us a rallying cry, I think, to bring various things together. So why tear it apart again? But I didn't think about that taking Shakespeare out of Romeo and Juliet was tearing it apart. I think, the, you know, those are different roles and I, I, I could definitely analyze them. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think it takes away from what I was saying. I, I was focusing on the performance and you know that. So I was, I was focusing on the performance and you're right that, that the theatrical arts also has well, I mean, there's also device theater where there's no explicit uh, writer, but yes, no, I take your point, but I don't think it takes away the, I was of course focusing on the performative aspect when I said that, you know, the actors are doing the egocentric the same way that a visual artist is doing something allocentric. So I think, I, I think you got my point, but um, okay. So I, I've left out people from the, from these arts. Yeah. Okay. Now I, mean, I will note your ideas and try to incorporate them better into my, my future thoughts. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Marta. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the talk. That was very interesting. Uh, and I have a comment, which is probably a follow up on what Michael said. And I have to say, I agree with you, Michael. Um, the, the two terms uh, that you had in your talk, uh, Stephen, they are Jesus and Myomesis. Um, I'm not sure they are two forms of storytelling. The terms uh, since Plato, uh, they have been used quite a lot. They are still in the toolbox of narratology, for example, for, for analyzing stories in different media. Uh, and the assumption is that uh, storytelling involves an interplay uh, of the two. Um, and then also um, equaling, even if we are talking about what typically counts as diegesis or narrating, equaling that with a uh, third person narration only no, um, not, okay. i'm not sure that the, uh, yeah I, I believe it is more nuanced than that because we can also have a first person narrator mm, for uh, sure. and then there is also the issue of focalization so like the narrator can be positioned uh in different ways uh with respect to the action so we can have narration from the inside of the action from the outside um, the narrator can be one of the characters uh, and take part in the main events or can be the observer. And uh, there is a lot of nuance to that. Uh, and then also there is this um, issue uh, in storytelling of perhaps a dissociation um, of, of the narrator from the storyteller, what uh, Michael touched upon referring to William Shakespeare in the case of Romeo and Juliet. So. Um, I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on, on that. Perhaps diegesis uh, and um, pantomime, like, do they allow um, the narrator 
to be separate uh, from the characters in a clear way, in an understandable way uh, to the audience. Uh, if you are miming a situation in which uh, the main character does something stupid, something that would make you lose your face, uh, having this institution of the narrator and being able to create the distance uh, might be uh, useful. And perhaps that is also another side of um, diegetic and uh, mimetic um, storytelling, which very often comes together, I would stress once again. So Marta, you just asked me these questions. <laughs> so, um, but I just wanna, the first word that you used was interplay. And I just wanna mention that Plato talks about the interplay because he talks about diegesis and mimesis, and then says they come together. So if you think about, he talks about the Homeric epics, but think about a bedtime story. If you're reading a bedtime story, it's mainly diegesis, but then there are quotations by the characters. And if you're, as a parent, if you're a good actor, you'll say, you know, you'll, you'll impersonate father bear and like the three bears, you'll do the father bear, mother bear, baby bear. So even Plato talks about that interplay that you can go from diegesis, you have the sections of quotation of the characters. If you're a good storyteller, you will actually impersonate the characters and use voices. Um, all your, all your points about narrativity, I mean, 100% agree. I, I know about all the nuances and I was trying to make a very simple thing. A lot of these nuances relate to also contemporary literature more than, you know, folk tales. There's, a, I think, a clear separation. Narrators are, are fairly outside the story and, and third person. So I know in the 20th century, um, writers have played with all different versions of narrativity. So I, I, I take your point completely and I've, I've read the literature, but I'm trying to make a simple talk about evolution um, of communication. So I think there, I kind of just rely on Plato as far as this being a distinct, you know, a distinction where the narrator is not part of the story, it's third person, etc. But no, I mean, it's a good point. And then your last, what was your last thing? Um, I got through two of your, the first two things you mentioned, but. Institution uh, of the narrator uh, as separate from the characters in the case of, of pantomime. So when you are showing or acting, uh, as you call it, more than telling the story. Uh, do you think it's possible to, to um, make it clear to the audience that you, as the shower, uh, you are not one of the characters uh, yeah, I mean, in real life? And, and um, do you have, like, have you ever noticed it? Uh, do you know anything about it from your experience, perhaps with the actors you mentioned? Because that is also connected with, like, uh, what you call narrating versus acting in a way. But I, I want to I bounce the question back to you because I mean, it, it's, the same thing came up in your experiment that how do you know when someone is doing them, is themselves versus another person? This, this is rarely talked about um, in, in the pantomime literature that you know, people do a gesture, you're identifying the gesture, but who's the, who's the agent? Who's actually doing the gesture? It's assumed to be you, but it could, maybe you're thinking about, oh, it's my friend, it's, you know, it's whatever, my brother doing it. How do you convey in a pantomime that it's not you? And how do people, how do people know when it's not you? I mean, so I'm kind of bouncing the question back to you because I think it's a fundamental question that, you know, people focus on the gesture itself and how, what the gesture conveys, but people don't talk about, well, who's, who's the agent? Is it, is it you or is it somebody else? And your example about doing a, you know, doing a woman versus a man and, and showing long, I mean, it's not straightforward to convey who the agent is. And I think, the default is, is that we assume that you are you, like you're depicting yourself, but I don't have an answer to the question because I think the field hasn't, in general, hasn't dealt with who's the agent um, when the person's doing a pantomime. Is it assumed to be you or is it some generic person? Is it um, a fictional character? I don't, I don't have an answer because I think the field doesn't, doesn't have an answer to, uh, to that question. And I promise I will give up the mic in a sec, but just one uh, thing. In pantomime, you can do embodying. So, so the example you you uh, talked about as well. So, representing a car crash uh, using your two hands, um, perhaps that is a kind of a narrative perspective. Uh, well, that's 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 the all separation and the the allocent is, is I think the most diegetic because I mean this is not can't be me. This this is happening in some extra personal space. These are objects that are not. My hands. So this is this is the most diegetic. But when I'm doing an, um, an egocentric pantomime, like I'm throwing, who's doing the throwing? I mean, so we can say, okay, the action's throwing. We can identify that it's throwing. There's an invisible ball, whatever. But who's the thrower? It's not. It's not clear. But I mean, here, it's, obviously, it's not me because this is I'm depicting two cars 
um, colliding. But when you say to a, to a patient in a clinic, okay, I want you to pantomime brushing your teeth. Is it you brushing your teeth? Is it, you know, your, your son brushing his teeth? It's not clear. Is this some, some generic um, impersonal agent? I think, that, so I've always been confused about, about this point. You know, who's the person doing, like maybe Paul is going to talk about this in the next talk, but it's not clear when you say do a pantomime. Well, who's doing it? Is, is it you doing the pantomime? Is it, is it, you know, D Donald Duck doing it? It's not, it's not clear to me. So I've always had this, this question and I had the same feeling when I, when I watched your talk. I mean, these are actors. Are they doing themselves? Are they doing, because your scripts are just like, it's a picture, right? So are you doing that character? Are you doing yourself? Uh, maybe Paula will address this when she talks about the children, whether they're doing themselves or whether they're depicting their parents. Um, but I think this is a big question for the field, like a big confusion for the field overall. So I don't have an answer, but I think it's the kind of thing that we in this field need to need to iron out. But I, I appreciate the question. So thank you so much for the answer. Thank you, Marta. Hello, Stephen. Yep, yep. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I can barely, barely. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. But, but kind of following up on our discussion yesterday. So, so, so thank you very much. Uh, now, given your separation between narration and acting, I understand much better what in your objection to, to, to my use and uh, yesterday. And the simplest, too simple way, you know, to uh, reconcile it is simply that acknowledge that I'm using the term narration in a broader sense. Mm. Right, without yep. making this distinction, and and, and uh, this is the expression side of, of the story, right? So when, when you say storytelling, I mean narration, and, and and I cut the cake in a different way. For me, it was more important the primary versus the secondary narrativity, right? Where 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 uh, a pantomime can tell you a new story, something that you didn't know before, while a single picture, arguably much more difficult, right? So, so mm -hmm. and, and, and and I appreciate very much bringing in depiction that you're doing also. I think I think this is this has been overdue, you know, to to to, to bring in drawing and, and and the fiction into it. So simply say, I mean, the reason that I the best I can do now to kind of reconcile our different ways of cutting the cake, uh, along with uh, Merlin Donald, wh whose work I'm sure you know, you know, he hasn't yeah. been mentioned enough. Uh, uh, I, I believe, you know, he doesn't talk about digesis enough, but mimesis he talks a lot about sure. a lot. Right. Sure. So, 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 if you remember also how I used his his theory and those diagrams of the tables, uh, I would say mimesis evolutionary comes first. Digesis evolves from mimesis, without leaving it behind. Right. So, so in your table that you had, you know, narrator's voice, character's voice, mm -hmm. general external to the story. So, so my, mimesis, simple narratives, simple stories, however you call it, are possible within the constraints of your properties of mimesis, right? Embodying, etc. Yeah, yeah. And then they Jesus to have this narrator's voice, third person perspective, past tense, monologue. This is, we're already in the, in, in the realm of language or at least yeah, not of language, right? Yep. right? So, so if, you, if you do it this way, because, because you are emphasizing them very much like parallel to each other, whether the core, if you take it more like uh, mimesis first, they Jesus after, would well, it, yeah. I think I, th I think I was saying that, that that theories of language origin don't distinguish them or don't talk about the language evolved. Like you have a model now which says, okay, mimesis first, digesis second, but <clears throat> nobody really talks about which. And I think it's really it's, it's really central to the pantomime theories because I think there are these two different kinds of, of ways of pantomiming. And so it begs the question of which one came first. I just want to mention about Donald. Donald used the term mimesis a lot, but not in, not in my sense or the Plato sense about acting. He uses it much more for about, about demonstration, uh, praxis. He doesn't use it in a theatrical sense, at least from, from my reading. So it's not, it's not the Plato sense of mimesis at all. It's more like maybe like a Peter Jardenforsch kind of sense about uh, demonstration, learning and all that. So for him, my metaculture is the kind that's based on you know, demonstration and praxis. So I haven't really adopted his thinking in this area because it's not, it's not really theatrical at all. He's not talking about role playing. The way that I am for when I use the term mimesis. So just a comment about Donald, but yeah, no, I think the, the field of language origin has to talk, think about well, which which came first between these two forms of narrative, either the diegetic or the mimetic. Did we start first with this third person stuff or the more embodied 
um, egocentric stuff. So I think, you know, that's, that's a question that we should be discussing. Thank you. I mean, Thank you, uh, it does connect to Aristotle, at least, uh, 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 Donald, and he does uh, place mind as a central aspect of, of uh, mimesis. And it, it, there is one quote, it's, it's primarily about acting. But some of it being communicative and some of it, some of it being more of a kind of self imitation for the sake of learning. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a learn. It's basically a learning theory. Exactly. So that, that's, that's the word that should come up. Donald's notion about mimesis is sort of a learning mechanism more than a role playing or acting mechanism. That, that's, that's my take on, on his thinking. So I haven't adopted his ideas in terms of role playing. It's much more of a learning, a social learning mechanism is the way I've, I've read it. Maybe I'm extending it in that way, but I, I usually try to fill in the blanks and, and make peace uh, and then end up being hated by everyone for that. But thank no, you very no, much. No, 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 thank you, Jordan. <laughs> Perhaps one very short comment. Uh, yeah. So thank you, thank you for the talk. And I particularly support the last, uh, the last uh, point that you made that uh, so far, this, uh, the, most of the studies have been very limited, including our own studies, right? Limited to, to choosing the, the right answer from the matrix, um, um, you know, limited in terms of stimulus as well, and uh, monologic essentially, right? So, so it would be so cool to have a program of dialogic studies or perhaps even trilogic, like a collaborative task where there is like actual pantomime conversation, right? Except mm. it will be so difficult, it's so challenging, right? To, to implement in actual designs. But if, if we can think of, of designs, it would be so marvelous. So I, I fully support this last point. Okay, thank you. Have you heard the question? Uh, because you froze for a Yeah, no, I, I froze for a second. I, I just heard the end and said, no, I, I, was there a question in there too? I, I didn't know. Perhaps there was the answer already, but. I heard a statement, I didn't hear a question. That's, I'm sorry, uh, well, can you repeat the question? So the, the, there, was no, there was actually no question. It was just a comment that I fully support the last point. Okay, yeah, no, th thank you. No, I, I didn't know there was a, I didn't hear a question, so that's why I didn't uh, make a response. But thank you, thank you for the support and the comment. And there are Zoom questions. I mean, we don't have the panel today, so uh, we don't want to finish terribly late, but I guess, yeah. Okay, so on Zoom, uh, we have a question from Francesco Ferretti and Francesco is, hi Stephen, thanks for the great talk. Uh, just a comment on dialogue, sure, turn-taking characterizes also non-human animal communication, but turn-taking in human conversation is quite different as it is governed by the logic of arguing and counter-arguing of interlocutors. Any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, so thank you, Francesco. So. Um... Yeah, I mentioned, well, that there's this co-construct, there's this back and forth that, you know, what I say is based on what you said before, and there's this, this string of co-construction, and like I said, people talk about adjacency pairs, um, governed by logic around, um, yeah, so I mean, no, I, I fully support your idea about persuasion, I, I fully support that, that, I mean, a lot of, a lot of dialogue is based on, on, I mean, it, it sort of depends on, on the nature of the conversation, but, um, Right now at a, at a conference, we're doing a lot of persuasion. We're trying to, you know, we're having these debates. So this format especially is oriented towards argumentation and, and persuasion. Personal conversations, maybe, maybe less so, but um, just looking at your question, so it's quite different. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, logic. And, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm totally on board with, with your persuasion perspective. And I was gonna say in response to your talk that this all, I mean, Jordan mentioned Aristotle. So, I mean, the whole notion about rhetoric you know, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. And so I think everything, you know, our ideas about persuasion really come also from the ancient Greeks that we should be consulting those kinds of texts um, because the whole field of rhetoric was something that was devised uh, by, by the ancient Greeks. And that's really all about <clears throat> how we persuade, how we get our, our arguments, our points across. And so, um, yeah, no, I'm definitely in the persuasion camp and I'm trying to read, read more Aristotle to learn about the roots of these, uh, these notions. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Actually, my first field was, uh, I, I, I was doing Indian philosophy, so there is a very important tradition and there's, they also had to say a lot about rhetoric. 
uh, but that's a side comment. I'm not asking a question. Uh, okay, I guess it's a relief to see that we don't agree on everything. So <laughs> thank you for this thought-provoking uh, uh, talk. And um, I guess we want to applaud Steve. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone.